Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, the things that we are doing on image and video generation. And uh, if you expect us, if you expect me to talk about deep fakes, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about deep fakes. Uh, we are not the bad guys trying to fool people around, but we try. Well, we are the good guys, so we are trying to use the deep fakes for uh, for for good things. And um, it's a lot of work that has been done. So here I listed uh, some of my collaborators, uh, postdocs, uh, friends, uh, students, and so on. So these are the people that directly contributed to this topic, but there are many more people in my group. Okay, so let me start with a little bit of history, right? So um, I've been interested in, uh, in doing, let's say, generation and uh, this type of things already from about, you know, 15 years or so. And this is something that, so this is a demo that uh, I had read in, um, um, I think I was done it around 2005, 2006. So this is an image of myself, you see also the, the hair. It's, it's not fake, it's, it was true in the time. Um, so practically here, what we were doing, we were having a, a face mask. And then what you could do, you could start, uh, you could, you could uh, get uh, another face and practically you will have a mask on your face and you can, uh, you can animate it. Uh, with the movement of your face, right? So this is um, my former PhD advisor, Tom Huang, and that was a page from his uh, web page. And practically, I put, I was glued it onto my face, and I was started to animate it a bit. In that time, um, of course, everything was. Um, uh, you can see it was very artificial. Um, you had the hole in the mouth. You see that uh, the hue is different, the color is different. So it's really looking like um, like uh, like a mask. Then, well, this is something around, let's say, 2018, so this is a 10 year span. This was um, uh, a video that I, I registered myself while I was in the airport going to, uh, to the 18th uh, birthday celebration of, of Tom. And this was uh, recorded on my, uh, on my mobile phone. And this uh, is an application done for one of my PhD students, Sergei Tuliakov, who is now at uh, Snap. Well, you can, uh, you could play all these kind of funny things to put mustache and so on, but then you could also put, you know, the, uh, the mask and you can see here now that um, the shading is much better and uh, it's also the, the quality is much better. And this is, as I said, this, this was running real time on my mobile phone. Well, this is now a little bit later uh, and this is something that I will present you in detail a little bit more. Practically, that's um, on, on the right, there is um, the image from my web page. And then um, one of my students was practically animating my, my image by using a driving video. So it's this guy that is, uh, you can see he's talking and then you can see my, uh, my static image that is animated and then I'm doing the, the head movements and it you also know, so talking like, like the guy, like, like guy, the guy in the driving video, okay? And nowadays, and this is a video that uh, I took from the, from the internet. It was not done by me, but it was done using our code. Uh, we'll, as I said, we'll go in details and let me, uh, let me play it. So this is, uh, I think she is Russian and she is a big influencer in TikTok. And then practically she was animating all these uh, funny faces. <laughs> Okay, so you could see that, of course, it's, um, it's able also to, uh, to get a little bit of 3D motion information, but also the movement of eyes and so on. So we'll talk a little bit in detail um, in, the next, uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to, to have a few topics. So these are uh, more of the things that, see, let's say, some recent work that has uh, been done in my group. So I will start with, uh, with the lower part here. So that would be uh, facial expression generation. And our goal here was to, to generate the same facial expression, but with introducing variability. So let's say different types of smiles. Um, then I will talk a little bit about um, um, generating images of, of people. So the, in this case, poses taken from different viewpoints. So you can see uh, here you have the, um, uh, an, an, originated, an original image, you have the target pose and you want to generate the, the view from, uh, from the other viewpoints. Then I will talk about this um, image animation using a driving video. 
So that will be this arbitrary object animation without 3D modeling. So not only faces, but also bodies and the characters and even a robotic arm that you see here. And I will, uh, I will finish with uh, some very recent work done in my group. So one is on playable video generation and then something on how you can do mapping from audio to video. And that would be something on trying to get uh, dancing people from uh, audio information. Okay, so I will start first with uh, this diverse my video generation. So this was um, a paper we had at CDPR, was an oral at CDPR, and then it's a recent paper at uh, Transaction of Multimedia. Uh, the idea is very simple. So we have to start, we want to start with a neutral face. We have a conditioning label. Let's say we want to generate a video of this particular person smiling. But you want to have a possibility to have this conditional smile, right? So you want to have different types of smiles, can be posed, can be creepy, can be nervous, can be different spontaneous, for example, overreacting and so on. Okay. And for this, we are using this conditional adversarial recurrent network. Then we have um, a system to do this uh, generation of kind of k different sequence of smiles. Okay. And well, the challenges here would be that, uh, first of all, we have the sequence generation condition on the priors, right? So that you have the input as a neutral uh, state and the, sm the smile label. Um, then you have the one to many type of thing. So you have a push pull loss. The idea is here that you want to push these smiles to be as diverse as possible, but you want to keep them together so that they belong to the class of smiles, okay? And finally, we also want to be able to preserve the identity, right? So we have, we go from the landmark sequence here and we want to, uh, to, to go to the real face on the mapping using a unit. Let me go a little bit in details in here. So we have, as I said, we have an input, uh, a neutral face, and this is uh, fed into the conditional uh, recurrent uh, landmark generator. We do have the conditional label as well. From here, we are generating uh, landmark sequences, and we are also having this multi-mode recurrent landmark generator, which will provide a little bit of details. And finally, we want to generate these expression videos. Here, you can see some examples. For example, the, the mouse is more closed, the eyes are closed in, in the lower part, and so on. But they are all smiles, okay? They are different types of smiles. So how do we do that? So at the beginning, we just encode the landmark image and uh, we generate a sequence of landmark embedding according to the condition label. Then we generate k different landmark embedding sequences. And finally, we translate these um, uh, sequences into a face video. A little bit of details. I'm not going to, uh, to provide you too many things. I'm going to, to tell you only the, the main principles. Right, so uh, in the conditional recorder network, so we are starting with this initial, initial uh, Y0, which is our initial input ne uh, neutral uh, phase landmark image. Then we generate these uh, landmark images, different, uh, different examples of this. And then we are using LSPM, to, which is receiving as input the concatenation of the, the previous stage and the embedding of the conditional labels. Then we are using this uh, push and pull loss. As I said, um, here practically what we are doing, we have two different uh, LSTMs. So one, it's uh, the top LSTM is generating diverse, uh, diversing styles. And the bottom one is generating conditional sequences. And finally, we are using skip connections to, uh, to allow this texture passing from the source to target to preserve the identity, right? So we do have uh, so this is our uh, original um, neutral face. We have the generated landmark and we are using the, the skip connection so that we are doing texture mapping and we are generating the face with uh, corresponding, uh, which will be correspond to the landmark in this case. Okay, so let's see what we're getting here. This is some examples. So this is the original sequence, right? So this is the ground truth if you want. And then we have different, different modes in which what you can see here, this is a sequence. I, I will show you also a video to see the transition, but practically here you see the different smiles. Um, there are differences in smiles. So for example, uh, in this particular case, you have the mouse is wide open, while in the lower one, at the end of the sequence, the mouse is still closed. 
And here you can see probably better on the landmark image, the eyes are closed, for example. So even if the person, if, it's, if I would ask you to tell what is the facial expression of this person, you, you immediately say that the person is smiling, but the smiles are different. So why do we need this type of stuff? Well, what we realize is that, especially for, uh, for some facial expression analysis, for example, if you want to, to detect spontaneous smiles, it's very hard to get label data. It's very hard to get training data. Using our system, you could generate the sequences, right, for free practically, and then you can use them in training, and you can show that in testing, you obtain much better results. Well, this is some comparison with the state of the art. Um, so our result is a CMM net. You can see that comparing to, uh, to, uh, to the other uh, images, we do have our, our images are much, much cleaner. Uh, you see, for example, for the video gun, you get a lot of artifacts. For the CRA net, you are having a change into identity. So here at the end, it ended up with a man and so on. This is for um, the spontaneous smiles. But then you have the post smile, the same type of situation. Here, you are also having troubles when you are having, for example, uh, glasses or, uh, you know, so you do have a lot of artifacts for the other images. So let me show you a, a short video on this. So practically here, what you have, you have um, faces. So this is the data set that was collected in my former group in Amsterdam, in which you had people uh, smiling and then you go from neutral to smile and then going back to neutral. And you see, these are the generated images. You can see the difference between um, a different type of smiles. So you have the difference between post and spontaneous smile. Of course, when you have the post smile, you have a much larger um, uh, expression. So this is another sequence with some other people. You have different type of, um, of configuration of the mouse and uh, on, the, on the eyes as well. And this is a comparison with, uh, with the other methods. Okay, so you can see that in, in our case, it is much smoother, so it's able to, uh, to capture very well the, the facial expression. And uh, in the other cases, you do have a lot of, a lot of artifacts. Okay, so this was specifically done for faces. And here um, we were basing it on the, the detecting landmarks. And we were doing the, the texture mapping so that we are generating the video. What, we, what, what I'm going to show you uh, later is that we were able also to do unsupervised. So in the end, we were kind of selecting the, the key points, the landmark on the face or on the body that are the most representative for motion. And we do the translation in that particular case. Okay, the second topic is this supposed weight human image generation. And um, so that was work done mostly by my uh, student, uh, Alex Yarovin. Uh, so he's been working a lot on these deformable GANs and um, it was quite a big impact. I think his paper, the CVPR paper has over 200 citations uh, in Google Scholar. And uh, well, the extension of the paper has just been uh, uh, published in PAMI uh, of this month. So, well, we all know by now this um, image image translation stuff. So uh, this is a paper by uh, by by um, Bern, Tine, and, and Luc Pangol and their students. Uh, practically here, what you have, you have a particular uh, person. You do have um, um, a heat map with uh, the key points around the body and with a little bit of uncertainty. Using the generator, you can do a prediction. You have an L1 loss for, um, uh, from the ground truth, and from there you can have a discriminator, and you have the uh, L gun loss to detect if the reconstructed image is, is real or is fake. Okay, so this is, this is the standard approach that, uh, uh, that people use for image image translation in this case. So what you can do, so you have uh, two types of translation. So one, you would have the, the typical rigid scene generation task, right, in which the local structure of conditioning and output image um, are well aligned. However, when you want to do this uh, deformable object generation task, the input and the output are not specially aligned. So what does it mean? Let me show you a, a simple example. Let's try, uh, let's consider that you, uh, you start with this area around here, 
if you just go through the network and then you you put it back to the to the target image, you see that it's corresponding to a completely different um, area. So in order to to do it correctly, what you need you need to have a deformation model. And this is precisely what we were doing in this gun. We were having this deformation gun. Okay. So what do we do? Well, let's let's assume now that we take a particular uh, body part. We just compute this affine transformation at h that practically goes from this p of x a to this p of x b for your your target c, and then this f h it's used to move the corresponding feature content uh, from, from, the, from the source image towards the target image. So what do we do? How, how do we do this? So we have a target stream. So here you have the target pose. You are computing this heat map using Gaussian blurring. You see the, uh, the, this is Gaussian blurring around the, the key points on the target um, the pose. Then we have um, this feature maps. So, which are shuttled by this heat connection from the, um, uh, the heat map. And then we also have the feature map that are directly obtained using up convolutional filter applying to the previous uh, layer maps. And on top of that, we have the source stream in which practically what we do, first of all, we know here that XA, so the, the body uh, and the, the, um, the heat map on the source image are well aligned by construction. Okay, then uh, of course in the HB here, the joint location may be far apart from XA, right? Because you have a completely different uh, target pose. Okay, then this HB cannot be concatenated with the other input tensor. So you do have uh, a different type of, uh, of stream for, for, this, uh, for this HB. And then in the end, you have here the blue blocks, you have this deformable tensor, which are shuttled by the formal skip connection from from this pair of XA and, uh, and the heat map. Okay. And finally, what you do at the end, you just add all the connections and you are doing the generation of the, of the, of the target uh, image in the desired uh, pose. So let's, let's see some examples. So this is an example what you have. So you have the, the input image, the source image. This is the target pose. And, and here you see um, the different methods. So this is the ground truth. You have a baseline. I don't remember exactly what the baseline is here. So the, uh, this is DSC. This is one of the, um, uh, the, the competitors. And this is our, uh, our method. Uh, what you can see is that uh, in our case, the image, it is a little bit blurred, but it's definitely having, uh, it's, it's having less artifacts. So the baseline is very bad, as you see in here. Uh, we are also able to, uh, to reconstruct part of the, um, um, the backpack. And I believe this is because we do have in this data set uh, in the market data set, we do have many people with, um, with so we have pairs of images with, uh, with backpacks. So the network is able to, to, uh, uh, to realize that when you, when you have this type of things on your site, it is translated on the, on the, on the backside as, um, as, as, as a backpack. So here you can see it is not, is not so well as in the other case. It's also because uh, probably there are not so many uh, examples in which you have the, the backpack worn only on, on, on one shoulder. Um, this is on the deep facial data set. Uh, here you have uh, most close in images. Uh, so this is the target pose and you see, and in our case, you can see that, for example, we are able to, to still to preserve also the, the logo on the, on the t-shirt. Also here we do have some, some good texture. Um, it, it's, doing, it's doing quite, quite well, even if the, um, uh, there is a big difference between the source images and the target post. Of course, it's not, it's not always uh, working well. So um, there are some, uh, some badly generated images here. So this is some example. So you do have some errors in the post estimation, right? So in this case, you see that it's, um, it's, it's not doing very well. You may have some ambiguity in the post estimation. So in some of the cases uh, here, uh, there is some, some very strange pose. So it's not able to, to, uh, to do it very well. But and sometimes you also have some rare poses like, like in this case here. Uh, in some cases, for example, when you do have some, some peculiar objects, like you have a, a, a bag in this particular way, since we don't have any examples, it's not able to reconstruct it very well. Okay, so as long as we do have a lot of data and we are able to, uh, to have um, 
see good views. The network is able to learn um, uh, good views also of external objects. We are able to reconstruct. Them. Okay, so now let's let's try to move it one even further. So this is a paper. Uh, this, these are two papers on image animation. It was an uh, an order at CDTR uh, 2019, and there is this first order motion model, which has become very popular. It's been published in Neurips 2019. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples of people using this first of the model to do uh, image animation. Okay, so what we try to do, well, first of all, there is always this debate on what, what to use. We want to use appearance or motion transfer. Before we were using appearance transformation. Now we want to use motion so that we do animation based on the important key points that are detected in an unsupervised way in the source of it, okay? So in the appearance transfer, it detects a pose in each frame of the driving video, and then you apply our pose-based image generation with the source image and each detected pose, okay? The problem is that in this case, you require a detector, right? So you need to get, for example, the skeleton detector, you need to get some information in there, and it doesn't work when the shapes of the object are different, right? For example, if you have a short to tall person, okay? So for example, so here you can see an example, you do have a source image like a horse and you may have an, um, let's say another object, it could be a dog or something else. And you can still make the horse run like a dog. I'm going to show you some examples, right? So if you do this, let's say unsupervised transfer motion, you are able to do this. Of course, the, the, the assumption is that you can, uh, the motions are compatible, right? I cannot just animate the face, sorry. I cannot animate the face to, to kind of um, capture the motion of a horse, okay? It doesn't make any sense, right? So you need to have compatible type of motion, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same type of objects. Okay, so what do we try to do? Uh, very simple. So we try to get, so we have pairs of, um, of frames, right? So this is your, um, let's say the source um, image. This is your target image. You put it through, through the network. So this is an encoder decoder type of stuff. You have this key point detector, right? So this is, so we call it monkey net because it's called the, it's, it's coming from the moving key points. So this is, um, has a motion specific key point detector delta in this area. Right, you have a motion predictor M, which is which is uh, generated in here, and then you have an image generator which reconstructs the image X prime from the key point position delta X and the delta X prime. Okay, of course here you do have, as you see, you do have um, a misalignment because of course you have to to move from these particular key points to the new key points, right? And we are using this to, um, we are using optical flow computed by, uh, by this um, uh, prediction network M to, um, to generate, um, and it's used by G to handle the misalignment between X and X prime, right? And the model is learned with a self-supervised learning scheme, right? So we don't have any supervision, spe uh, specific supervision in here, okay? So what we do, this is the motion prediction. So we, from the appearance of the first frame and the key points motion, um, the network M will predict uh, a mass for each key point and the residual motion, right? So we have the, the mass for each key point, you see it in here, and then we do have the residual motion in order to be able to, um, to, uh, to, to capture the motion information. And then at the testing time, the model generates a, a video with the object appearance of the source image uh, but with a motion from the driving video, right? So we are transferring the motion from the source image and each driving frame, and we are providing the generator um, with a relative uh, difference between the key points. Okay, so let me show you some, some examples. So this, um, this is a video in which you will see uh, <coughs> some of the learned key points. They may not have, um, as in previous case, they may not have a geometrical, um, uh, meaning, but they are the ones that are detected as being representative from the motion. And this is serious, we see from the faces, but we are also using our bodies, and we, we could see also another example, it's on a, on a robotic arm that it's, uh, it's moving.
Meta, you see that um, that the points are are moving, are, are not fixed, and are capturing the particular local motion at a particular time. And this is an example. Here we have a driving video, so you see a robotic arm. Here we have a, a static image. It's not the same robotic arm, but you can see that the optics are different. And we are generating the video of this robotic arm going into the new uh, the new stage. This is another example in which you have um, a driving video from, let's say this is like like, uh, like visual try on type of stuff. Here it's, uh, it's a data set called Tai Chi in which we are generating the videos of, uh, you know, so these people are, we are animating the static images of these people to do the motion of these uh, <coughs> driving videos. You can see there are a little bit of problems, especially when you have complex background here. So somehow when the motion is it's doing, uh, it's, it's occluding a little bit of background, you have a little bit of uh, the effect of, of waving in the background. <coughs> there is not perfect. <coughs> and this is what I uh, that, what I promise you. Here you have uh, different driving videos, and you have different objects, and you are animating this with this uh, this object. Okay, so here this is more like a cat, and you are you are animating a horse, and so on. So it it, it doesn't matter. So it's working pretty good enough. And then going back to faces, uh, here uh, you can animate. You know, you have Obama and Trump, and you can animate. Uh, you know, different other uh, people and whatever. Uh, Mona Lisa to uh, to do the same type of uh, of work. Please know that when you have a very strong uh, or stronger head pose, then you do have a little bit of, um, of, of distortion. And I will come back to this, so for, let's say more like some of the things that, uh, that we try to do next. Well, we had some evaluation hours. It's, uh, it's better also from the uh, both average key point distance and average Euclidean distance, but also from the, the user study point of view. So, um, our, uh, so, so we had a user study and the users uh, liked our method much more than, uh, than some of the competitors. Uh, one thing that was, as, as I told you, this uh, first order motion, uh, first order model has been used, so, so the code is available and has been used by many people. I'm going to show you a part of this video. So this is, this is, this is um, it's, um, it's a series of videos in which there is this guy, which is, uh, uh, he's doing a two minutes video. He's taking some some papers and he is, is running the code and it's, uh, it's, it's making this, uh, this video in which he's kind of testimony um, um, the technology. I'm going to play a little bit. This is what is called the two minute papers. And practically he was kind of doing it independently. Dear uh, fellow scholars, this our, is two minute uh, papers with Dr. Karo Jona Ifahir. It is important for you to know that everybody can make deep fakes now. You can turn your head around Mouth movements are looking great, and eye movements are also translated into the target footage. And of course, as we always say, two more papers down the line, and it will be even better. And, and it keeps on going, and he's doing point. this presentation. Well, he's, he's one, explaining how most to previous do algorithms so required uh, additional information, yeah, for instance, facial landmarks or a pose estimation of the target subject. Anyway. Why make these videos on deepfake? So, well, decisions for us. You see me doing it here. So and again, kind of you see this technique in action here to demonstrate that it works really well, well right? so, for so video footage in the wild. Note that these talks uh, and consultations the... all happen free of charge, and if they keep inviting me, I'll keep showing up to help with this in the future as a service to the public. The cool thing is that later, over dinner, they tend to come back to me with a say. And now, please enjoy the promised footage. Dear fellow scholars, this is two minute papers with Dr. Karo Jona Ifair. It is important okay, so, for you to know that. So once again, we had, we had nothing to do with it. So the guy took our code and he is kind of, he was running this, uh, this code and then he, he, he prepared this video. And I think it's a good advertisement for our work. And it's also, it's a good way of, let's say, testing um, and evaluating the robustness of our method, right? So there is some independent people that takes a code and it's kind of creating this animation on itself. Okay, uh, some, some other things that we've been doing, this is related to this one, it's uh, again using motion information to do copart segmentation. So what does it mean? So practically we want to leverage motion information to train a segmentation network without using any annotation. 
So at training, we are using a pair of, let's say you have a source frame, a target frame, we do the segmentation and we want to put together the appearance and the, um, the motion segmentation. So the areas that are related to the motion part. Then we do the reconstruction and we are reconstructing the target frame, okay? So we are predicting the segment in the target that can be combined with the motion representation between the two frames to reconstruct the target frame. And then at the inference type, uh, at, the, at the inference, we use the train segmentation model to predict the object part segments. Okay, again using motion and appearance together. You will see. I'm going to show you some examples. So first of all, uh, the segmentation model will predict the segmentation maps uh, y s and y t, right, and the fine motion parameters, right. So the one here that are uh, indicating how the particular segments are moving from one um, uh, from one um, uh, segment to the other one. And then with the, the reconstruction module, we are computing the background uh, visibility mask. So we are telling which area it's supposed to, uh, to, um, to, um, to, to do the motion animation and then the optical flow. And we are reconstructing the target frame by warping the features of the source frame and masking the occluded frames. Okay, so this is just an example. Uh, again, here, uh, some of the um, uh, particular segments, they do not have necessarily a meaning, but uh, you will see they are quite, quite well captured from the motion point of view. And you will see later what we are using it for. Right, so you see in our case, it's working, uh, it's working much better than, um, than in other cases, than in our competitors. It's again for the Tai Chi, a few different uh, input sequences. And you can use this information and you will see uh, a little bit later in the video to do part swap. So practically you can take a particular part, let's say it's a lips of a, of a particular person and you can try to, uh, to replace it into a, a, a given video. Let me start to skip to that. coming now. Yeah, so practically here, what you want to do, so this is uh, the visibility mask, you have the source image, let's say uh, Tom Cruise, and you want to, to take the hair of Tom Cruise and to, to put it on top of this guy and then to animate it in the same way, right? So the same gear, you want to get the hair of this guy and put it on top of this guy. This is what uh, what is doing. There are still some some small problems with the background, but it's working pretty uh, pretty reasonable. And I have a few other examples. So here you can take the glasses, also the nose. The same in the in the lower part, you take the nose, and also the eyes are different. Okay, and it's still it's still working quite uh, quite 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 reasonable. Here we are taking the lips. But also here we take the eyes, for example, you see there are the blue eyes and the eyes are the, the one from the source. Okay. Well, there are a few other examples. Again, you can take the hair, you can take the area around the mouth, right, with, uh, with the beard and so on. All right, so you can use again the motion information. Uh, so use appearance and motion in order to, uh, to be able to, uh, to do the animation and do the fakes on, uh, on, on, other, uh, on other faces. So here we put it uh, in our glasses from Harry Potter and uh, well, we do have also the, the hair, it's a bit different and so on. Okay, one, uh, one recent work that, uh, that um, has been done in my, in my group. So this is uh, the work of, um, of a student of uh, my colleague, Eliza Ricci. So, uh, and, uh, um, so, so it's Willy, Willy Benapes. Um, practically what, uh, what is done here. So you start uh, considering an, uh, a set of unlabeled video, right? And for example, uh, a player, uh, a tennis player, and what we want to do, um, without using any annotation, we want to, uh, to learn a model that represents observer, the observed environment and to allow the user to input action to the model through a controller at the testing time. So practically, I want to generate um, a particular action, like for example, this person moving uh, up and down or uh, moving, moving to the left and moving to the, to the right, okay? 
So here, practically, you have uh, you want to produce a video where the agent acts according to the action specified by the user. So, for example, you want this guy to move to the right. You see it here generated. You want then the guy to move forward. You see it's moving uh, over the, the baseline. And then you want, uh, in this position, to move again to the right, and so on. So this is the idea of this playable video generation. So how do you do this? Well, you sample an input sequence and use an encoder network to extract um, uh, frame features. Then you use a pair of successive uh, frame features to infer the action, right? So it will perform according to the transition using this action network. It will come back uh, later with details. Uh, then you are using, uh, using these features and the action, you learn a recurrent model to produce features representing the successive states. Okay. And then these are translated back into, uh, into the image using the decoder network, right? So you started through the image in this area, and then the, the, um, uh, the person is moved, is moved to, the, to the next location. And you can also use some extra supervision to encode back um, the, the, the produced frame using the encoder and the action network, right? So just to make uh, this consistency stuff. And practically here, so these are the type of, um, of cell supervision type of so glosses. So you want this reconstructed uh, frame to be as close as possible to the, to the original frame and so on. Right? And in the end, you can have this model unrolled over the entire sequence. So for the action network, we first encode the frame feature using a multilayer perception to, a perceptor to produce two embeddings. Then we take the difference between these embeddings, and uh, these are the representation of the action direction, so this dt. Um, and then when we, when we visualize this dt, we can see what are the type of transitions that are observed in the training video. So this is more like transition from a particular stage to another one that, that are legible that, that you can learn. And then you can see which action is, uh, is done, so you can move left, right. But you can also look at how the action is performed, right? You can look at the speed, you can look, you can look at the limb movement, uh, at the limb movement, but here using the variability of the embedding, right? So you are learning here how the part a particular way in which an action is performed. So you can see here, we are generating different types of actions. Uh, so this is the action learned from, uh, from, your, um, from, uh, from the set of unlabeled uh, videos. You can see that in tennis, you can move uh, you know, left and right. You can, you can move up and down and so on. So this is um, uh, a wide uh, range of action that you can, uh, you can learn uh, from, um, uh, from your uh, training set. This is the same um, type of stuff in which you can learn the type of action that, for example, this particular robotic arm can, uh, can do. Yeah, so you can move left and right and uh, up and down. Uh, and quite interestingly, you can also uh, do some interpolation between the actions, right? So even if you have not seen it into your uh, original data set, you have not seen, for example, diagonal motion like in this case, you can still reproduce it by simply interpolating between these uh, particular actions, right? Between the action, I don't know, between the action going, uh, going forward and the action going, uh, going left. Right, so you can just generate this particular movements in which a person is moving in diagonal. Right, so let me show you the, the video. This is just to give you an example in which the user it's, uh, it's using the keywords to kind of uh, move the player around. Right, so now you can move left. This is action seven, action five. And then you can bring him back, he can move up and so on. And you can see that the generated uh, action, it's, it's, quite, it's quite reasonable, right? So, so when he moves to the right, he's also moving the hand. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite credible. So I think it's, um, so to me, this is, this is really the future. So it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, impressive. OK, finally, so I think I'm just, uh, just in time. Uh, what, what, this is something that we are working at the moment is to try to, to use a multimodal system. So we want to, uh, to generate, for example, to do uh, videos of people, of dancing people using audio as input. Okay, so practically in the first stage we are doing music to skeleton. So we are starting some uh, music features. Okay. Then we are using a self frames graph attention network. I will uh, give you in the next slide some details. And the cross frame temporal graph attention network. We are doing the fusion 
And practically, we are generating the sequence of uh, stick models that are moving according to uh, what we learn in the mapping between audio and the training videos. And then in the second stage, practically, we are um, applying what we had before, in which we are moving from uh, the skeleton to the dense audition, from the skeleton to the, to the actual person movement. Okay? And here, what we do, we are using the forward and backward self-supervision regularization method. We'll, uh, we'll give you details in the next, uh, in the next slide. Okay, so this is a self, um, the self-framed spatial graph annotation network. So practically here, we do have the, the key points that we, um, that we need to learn. And we are looking at the uh, relationship between different key points that are related to this, uh, let's say the key point of interest in here. And we are doing a weighted sum of this to get the stuff. And uh, for the cross frame temporal graph attention network, we are looking at different um, um, in time here, and we are looking in forward uh, relationship between the key points and um, and the one that of interest, but also backward, right? So this is some kind of looking at uh, at appearance on one hand, but also at uh, at the temporal correlation between uh, between frames. So here it's looking more like a, if you want more like a memory bank in some way, in which you can you can you can try to use this information to to learn better. Uh, the movement of the person, right? And here you have the, um, uh, the self-regularization ne network in which you are going from, uh, you are animating this particular static image, you are animating it with um, a with, uh, generated um, uh, sequence of, uh, of, uh, of poses. And here, practically, we are using both forward and backward type of um, uh, network so that we are getting better uh, um, animation of, uh, of, the, of the object. All right, and this is what you do. So practically you are getting this, uh, the music part to generate uh, the skeleton sequences, and then this is the conditional image, and then practically you are animating the static image that you see in here. So in the video, the video I have it only the, the stick model generation, as you can have an idea, let me try to play it. We do have ballot, we do have several samples. Let me skip some of this stuff. We do have um, we'll make you buy, 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 so young and wild. Okay, all my I think we have someone. Let me skip some of them. And then there is also a uh, comparison with, uh, with state of the art. This is dance to music. This is a new uh, 19 paper and an ACM multimedia paper. So you see the towers, it's, um, it's, it's better, it's, it's, it's closer to the real. Okay, so all this started when I was talking to, uh, to my student Tao and I told him that uh, I want him to make me do the moonwalk. And well, he still didn't uh, didn't show me the demo with with myself doing the moonwalk. But I mean, this is this is getting closer to uh, to what uh, what I expected from uh, from him. Okay, so let me see a little bit just to wrap up. I think I'm just in time. Um, so, what are the limitations and uh, and some extension of, uh, of what I presented? So, one of the things that I already um, indicated is that um, issues with uh, 3D mo uh, movements. So, let's say when you have very strong uh, head or body poses, uh, one of the, the things that we are working at the moment is to incorporate the modeling of 3D key points or other 3D information. Okay. Uh, another thing that, um, that uh, so it, it, we, we show that uh, using unsupervised um, uh, key point detection for motion. It's working better, but in some cases, especially if you want to do some, let's say, talking heads and so on, 
maybe you want to do something in between using some strict um, some some landmarks that are based on appearance and some other type of landmark that are unsupervised by, based on motion okay uh, another thing that uh, that so far I've, sh I've showed you we are only making single objects right so if you look at even in the playable video generation we had only a single um, uh, tennis player but what you would want to do is to animate multiple objects and also you would want to consider interaction and constraint between them right so imagine to the tennis uh, game uh, a particular person is not moving independently of the, uh, the let's say the opponent right or of the ball so you could, you could try to say look this motion it has to be um, let's say constrained according to some other type of things right so you could have uh, also considering different people so imagine people interaction or complex surveillance scene and so on you can also consider interactive video generation right in which as i said as a player well it's only one example but you can you can imagine also some other type of things and then what you can try to do is to use a video to video translation so this uh, there are already a few a few works but imagine that you can want to use video generation to different domains right so you have a sequence of comics and you want to generate a video or vice versa right uh, one thing, so last but not least, of course, there are some possible ethical issues and there is work right, right now that it's coming on uh, deep fake forensics. Um, what I want to stress once again is that indeed we are doing generation, but our goal is not to, let's say, uh, um, try to make, let's say, to fool people around, but uh, practically we, we, we want to use this generating content for, for many things. So one example, the first example was uh, trying to uh, to do da data augmentation, right? So try to improve um, your uh, training set so that you can do better um, uh, better uh, inference. Um, you can also try to uh, to support creativity, for example, of people. So there are many other things in which you can do. So I don't think it's um it's a it's a problem uh, uh, for uh, working into this domain. And I think it's a lot of um, it, I think it's a very hot area. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is that we've been working uh, closely with uh, with a few companies. Uh, so good collaboration we had with uh, with Snapchat. So one of my former PhD students is, is working there. And um, uh, a few weeks ago, I think like a week or two weeks ago, Snap uh, um, released a new filter, which is based on the first order model that, that we developed. Okay, so that's all. And um, thanks for listening and I'm uh, open to questions.